In this video, I am joined by a fantastic panel on this episode of the Orange Nerd Show. We're talking all about the upcoming Disney animation feature, Wish. We're going to talk about the film itself, our thoughts on the trailer. We'll talk about what maybe the box office uh, uh, projections might be with this one. There's a lot to discuss here. This is a big movie for Disney up next on the Orange Nerd Show. Welcome on board, everybody, to the Orange Nerd Show, an OD55 production. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for joining us today. We're talking all about Disney Animation's Wish. The trailer dropped a few days ago. It's making waves. We're going to break it down, talk about it. We're talking box office, all that good stuff. But before we do that, I want to introduce my fantastic panel. We have Jay Shear, host of the Story Geeks here on the channel with us. Jay, thank you, sir, for coming on board. Yeah, it's good to be here. I feel like I'm instantly the least intelligent person on this because I don't have glasses. <laughs> and I don't know what to do. I need some glasses. <laughs> you got to get you some oh. frames, man. Yeah, I know. I got to get some fr OG frames. I got to get some OG, like OG 55 orange frames. Oh, that would be. That'd be sick. That'd be sick. That'd be sick. <laughs> if you can let everybody home know where they could find you on uh, social media. Yeah, check me out over on X at Jay Shear. I'm over there saying some nonsense here and here and there, responding to Josh's nonsense, you know, <laughs> those kind of things. <laughs> check him out. And he's also the host here on uh, the channel for Story Geeks. We break down right lately. We've been breaking down Ahsoka. We got that finale coming up, um, which is going to be tonight. tonight. Tonight is the finale when we're recording this. You might you might see this tomorrow, but tonight. Tonight, at, at the time it's recording, Ahsoka. So check us out over there. And uh, we got some other great stuff planned over there. So uh, make sure you check out the Story Geeks with Jay Shear. The next and episode is George's idea, by the way. We're going to talk about George's idea. I'm not, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. Because it's going to be, Ooh. we're going to keep it secret for a little bit. But it's a good idea. Great idea. Fantastic idea. And speaking of George, we got Citrus George in the house. Welcome back, brother. How's it going? Thanks for having me back on. And uh, ready to talk some Disney animation. I know we don't really get to do it that quite often, like with everything going on with the theme park. So it's it's a nice breath of fresh air to talk some uh, Disney animation. And on a positive note at this point, so <laughs> you know, we haven't done that in a while either. But anyway, if you'd like to follow me, you could do so on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Disney George. You could also check out the podcast I'm part of called A Walk with Walt. And, of course, you'll find me here on my home base at Orange Grove 55 with Citrus Corner with all that sweet, juicy, but sometimes sticky Disney news and info. There we go. There we go. And Thanks. Mr. Jay Shear got it down pat now. He got I got it, it down. <laughs> I, missed the, I missed the 55, though. I missed the 55. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we got Josh, Mr. Modern Mouse, back on the channel. Josh, it's always an honor and pleasure having you on here, sir. If you could let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media. Yeah, find me at Modern Mouse. Josh, I didn't, I didn't write it, here, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at Modern Mouse Josh on uh, TikTok, X, or uh, Instagram, it's really hard to like say X. So you know. um, yeah. But uh, or you can find uh, youtubecom slash Mouse where I'm constantly talking about animated films. So this is uh, this is my wheelhouse right here. Absolutely, absolutely. Muppets, it's either this or the Muppets. One of the two. That's true. Which, we we, we got to do a big Muppet show with Josh. That's what we, we got to do. do. Yeah. It. And he has to show up as a character. As a Muppet <laughs> character. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so, the, so the other day, this, this, this uh, trailer dropped for Wish. And um, there's been a lot of thought. Look, it's been doing very well. Numbers-wise, it's been viewed by a lot of people. This has been doing very well. Best numbers since Frozen 2 in terms of the trailer. Um, interesting trailer, interesting movie overall. Jay, I'll, I'll just start with you and go down the list. Overall thoughts about this trailer? Love it, like it, hate it. Where, where do you stand with this? Oh man, I'm usually I'm usually pretty much Switzerland about trailers. To be honest, like I'm pretty neutral. Like I don't like get behind any trailers. I a trailer to me is is not that different than an advertisement. It's just an advertisement that's crafted to try and go crafted of a bigger storyline. Um, and I always feel like it's really hard to judge a work by its trailer. Like there are some trailers that are even better than their films. Like the man of steel trailer is in my opinion, the best trailer of all time. The man of steel trailer, go watch it. If you haven't seen it in a while, cause it is like perfection. You know, the movie is good. It's really good. I like it a lot. Um, I might even call it a masterpiece, but the trailer is better, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, um, so I see a trailer like this. I think 
it has all of the things that it needs to be a Disney hit. It has a very cute sidekick, which we see in the in on the frame right now with the little yeah. with the little wish character, the star character. They're, um, very Japanese kind of style. I, I like that. It's kind of cool. yeah, which is probably smart on Disney's part, right? Like go international with this as much as you can, which is phenomenal. Um, the setup and the premise seems pretty interesting. The lead the lead character here seems pretty interesting. It looks like she's going to be going up against. I'm a little unclear as if that's her father or like she's related to the guy that's the goatee guy, the, the sinister goatee guy. I don't oh, know yeah. how she fits into that. Maybe it's just the king and she's just not related to him at all. But, um, you know, good villain looks like Jafar, looks like Jafar with money. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, look, I think that it has all the elements it needs. How is it going to do? It's hard to say until we until more of it's fleshed out. Like we've seen some great trailers from Disney, and then we went to see those films, and they were okay. We've seen some trailers that weren't so good from Disney, and then we went to see those films, and they were fantastic. I, it's really hard for me to judge a book by its cover, and that's what it feels like with the trailer. You know. Well said. Well said, Josh. Overall thoughts on the trailer? <clears throat> uh, as as the animation guru here, uh, <laughs> no. I, uh, as far as the story is concerned, this is this feels a classic disney um there's nothing that like i'm completely blown away by yet i'm kind of in the same realm as jay in the sense of you can't really tell a full story from a trailer or at least you shouldn't um it should really more set a mood and tone and the mood that it's giving here feels like it fits within kind of disney's revival era of the last like 10 years or so while also feeling classic, it fits right along with Snow White, but it also fits right along with Aladdin or it fits right along with, uh, you know, uh, Tangled or Frozen. So it feels like it spans time. I'm coming out of this much more interested in the style of animation and kind of the developing changes that are coming um, with the art form. Uh, and I'm really kind of loving what I'm seeing here. Um, and I hope that this is just the beginning for some new things for, for full length animation from the Walt Disney Company. Great points, great points. And uh, yeah, the style of animation is very, very interesting. I want to bring that up in a second. But George, uh, yeah. your thoughts on the trailer? Yeah, I, I have to echo these fellas. It's it's one of those things where it I'm intrigued by by the the trailer i'll say that it it, it makes me want to know more and learn more and i think that's where a good trailer comes from if, if it it's supposed to give you a sense of stability as like a, a tease to say you know here is what you could see the full length uh film if you go see this but here's a little a little taste of it and honestly it it harkens back to you know disney and you know the disney greats and i think disney does well when they stick with the the fairy tale slash musical kind of concept and i feel like you know going back to those roots it's it, it's great it's you know with a female uh main character uh, a couple sidekicks you have a great villain um this this villain and I love how in the trailer it actually showcases who the villain is. The last right. couple of movies we haven't really gotten a good Disney villain, and I feel like this one may kind of restart that. I mean, I mean this guy looks like it's the first Disney villain that has like an OnlyFans account, but um, <laughs> it's pretty sexy, huh? Pretty but sexy. I, <laughs> but uh, and also speaking of the animation, it I love how it ha kind of infuses that. Uh, 2d kind of quality mixed in with right. computer cgi and we've seen that with a couple uh disney shorts they did with paper man and uh feast uh those right. those animated shorts kind of have that that 3d quality but yeah. also still has that that 2d cell animation to it and i i love how they kind of can blend that in with this and i think that's also going to carry the story along as well yeah, it, it's it's really the perfect like in terms of the animation style, um, it's really the perfect choice for a film that's celebrating 100 years of the studio. And why I think it's the perfect choice is because it's taking both worlds, both styles. It's taking hand drawn and it's taking computer, which are both of these styles are very very important to the studio over the last 100 years and putting them into one movie. So it, it's a celebration of both art forms in a lot of ways, which I really like. I really dig that. 
Um, overall, I like this direction that CGI is going in. You're seeing a lot more stylized animation now. There was like almost like an arms race for a long time to get as real as you can possibly get, right? And I think they finally hit a wall. Like it's basically like at a certain point, it just becomes live action. It's so real. Um, I like the fact that a lot of these studios, not just Disney, even like Universal with like the Puss in Boots with that kind of painted look with Puss in Boots, it's more stylized. I like this approach. Now, you know, you can only get so real. So I, I like that they're kind of getting a little more creative, these studios, with how they approach this stuff now. CGI is endless. The potential there, you can do anything you want with it. So why not play in that sandbox? Um, I thought the trailer was pretty good. Um, it, it feels very classic Disney to me. Um, I love the little little uh, like Japanese style star. I think it's adorable. I think it's gonna that thing is gonna be the merch money maker. I think right there. Um, yeah, I'm excited for it. I think the music sounds gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I love the fact like what George touched upon that we actually have a villain from the start. Like you know he's a bad guy from the beginning. I love that. I think a lot of fans have been wanting that for a long time. The twist villains that they've been doing is cool. I mean that's there's a place for that. You know you use you. you you can do that stuff, but you don't want to overdo it, right? You don't want to be, you don't want to trade one trope for the, for another trope necessarily. So you don't want to go overboard with anything. So I'm glad they're kind of returning to like the, the, the baddies again from the beginning. So that's great. Um, we'll see, we'll see how it is. Now there are some meta elements in here. Like I know because it's, it's celebrating the 100th anniversary of the studio, there's going to be little Easter eggs of various films. I know like in the trailer, you see the, the poisonous apple from Snow White and things like that. I like those little touches if they're subtle. My fear, though, with this is there some of these are not going to be subtle. I, I don't want it to be like, a, ah, look at that, right? I, I Hopefully, it's like in the background, all these little nods to past animated films. Because Disney's been doing that forever. I mean, you look at some of the Pixar stuff, and I think in Boo's room in Monsters, Inc., there's a little, a little Nemo toy in her room. Mm -hmm. They've been... They've been placemaking that for a long time. That's fantastic. But if we have like actual cameos of like one of the seven dwarfs or something, it gets a little, it gets a little too much for me. So I'm hoping they keep it subtle, but we'll see. I'm open to it. So I don't know. Overall, I think that it's a, it's a decent trailer. It seems like people are taking to it. I don't know. But my, my next question to you guys, I'll start with you, Jay. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit. Cause you know, we, we, Oh, Oh, I guess I, not. I, I, I completely hit the. You got rid I of me. Hit, yes. I completely hit the wrong button. I do apologize. Let's see what Jay has to Let's say. Let's see what Jay has to say, and then it's like <laughs> boot him out. Boom! There he goes. There he goes. Uh, no, I do apologize, Jay. No, um, well, uh, go, so we saw the trailer. The trailer's numbers are doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always necessarily pan out to box office, though. Like, and this is a big movie for Disney. You know, the last movie, um, uh, Strange World didn't really perform that well in the box office. Encanto didn't really perform in the box office, but it made up for it on Disney Plus and became a cultural phenomenon, you know? So I think that was, uh, even though the box office was weak, I think it was overall a huge success for Disney. So, but there's a lot riding on this one. Jay, do you think that this movie, you think it'll do well? You think it'll open well in, in November? Or you think that is? Good question. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I do think, Let's let's break this down. What do you what do you need to have in the modern day to have a Disney film work really well? Um, we've seen it with you know this is from the same producers of Moana. This is from the same producers of Frozen, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they they take things that are uh, close, sort of closely related to us, but in the fantasy environment, right? right. In other words, Moana is not like a history of the Polynesian people. It is a fantasy story that has Polynesian people in it. Right. It's the same thing with, um, with frozen. It's like, that's not a movie. I don't, I'm not going to that movie thinking I'm going to see the history of, uh, you know, Sweden or Norway or wherever that takes Norway. place. Yeah. Norway. But instead I'm going to that to realize it's a fantasy world that just happens to be like taking inspiration from that area of the world. I think, that they've struggled more with their animation when they try to be either two real worlds, like Turning Red, uh, or even Soul. Even Soul, I, I think Soul would have performed a little bit better in the in the theaters. But you're bringing the real world into the fantasy context almost too much, and I think that that, that Disney doesn't do as well when that happens. Because I think that a lot of people put their own beliefs, their own opinions about what the real world should or shouldn't be into the film and then that then that creates controversy for it yeah. and whether or not they want to see it 
But when Disney sticks to these to these more fantastical stories, they tend to do better. So the fact that the trailer is doing so well to me says it's going to probably do pretty well at the box office as well. The fact that it's coinciding with Disney's 100, the fact that it's also um, coming at the end of the year when families are going to be together for Thanksgiving, I think is a really positive sign for it. Um, and I think that as long as Disney can stay, as long as Disney can stay out of the culture war conversation like if we all of a sudden start seeing a a bajillion youtubers doing like oh here's this young girl of color taking down the patriarchy of the king because he's you know using all the wishes if we start to see that um i think that that's not good for anybody personally i don't think that it's go see the movie before you, you start going there Right. Um, if we start to see that kind of thing happening, then I think that we could see the movie kind of underperform if it gets caught up in the culture war. I think what Disney should do instead is just make sure that it doesn't Disney nor its performers or its writers or directors should start putting out those little messages that sometimes people like to do that make something political that shouldn't be. It's just a fantasy story in a fantasy world. Just let it be what it is. Let it speak. Let the story speak to you before you go speak through the story um i think that would be uh the ideal situation here so i think it's going to do well i don't know i mean none of the four of us are like i gotta be there opening day so that's a little bit troubling right right? like there are certain movies where we might say that but i think it's going to do well just be based on all the other factors that are going on right now yeah 100 100 percent. and historically the the the, these fairy tale musicals have sort of well they've, they've 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 kind of jump started like um, very successful eras of the Walt Disney Company, whether it be Snow White or whether it be Little Mermaid or like, you know, typically these films are like these big kind of movies where they do well and then they kind of jump start bigger things beyond, you know. Yeah. Um, I think the only one that kind of didn't do that was Princess and the Frog. I think that one kind of underperformed a little bit when it when it premiered in 2009. But, but Tangled was part- the follow up that, that built the revival. That, yeah, Tangle was a follow up that, that that built a revival exactly, and 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 Princess and the Frog has sort of become it's sort of like a uh, almost like an Encanto, right? Where it maybe it underperformed initially, but it has become like fans have grown to it and really embraced it, you know. And, and I think and I think the Princess and the Frog would have done much better, just like what Jay was saying, because it got, it got caught up in the cultural war. You know, they had to go back into that film so many times and change. Uh, the character of Tiana, for instance, her name and the background of her character and what have you. So it it got caught up in and and people knew about that, you know, while the movie was being in production. So it by the time the film was actually completed and released, people were kind of iffy to say, well, do we really want to see this film? You know, but then as you had mentioned, OG, as time went on, people got to watch the film and take yeah. it for what it's worth and not you know kind of go on this pandering notion of like oh what could it have been but really right. what it is now and it became popular now than it was back then but really quick before you move on to to josh i have a question sure. for you jay you said that this may not be a, a film to go see opening weekend now for me really i don't think there has ever been uh that i can recall an animated film that i kind of jumped at to see opening weekend was there one for you well that's a really good question there have not been that many okay so um i I can say that the only ones that i've seemed to wanted to go see opening weekend were when i had a very very strong um desire to see what the studio was doing so for example i saw because inside out was so good i know it wasn't in theaters but i saw i watched soul opening weekend right like as soon as it came out on the on on uh on disney plus i was watching it um so a lot of animation i do not get out for opening weekend but like for standouts where i feel like this is this is more of an event film than it is like in just a film for any reason another good example would be um uh into the spider-verse and the and and the sequel across the Spider Verse, like those were like event films that I was like, I gotta be in the theater to see this because like I don't want to get spoiled. I want to see this for all it's worth. I know the animation is ridiculous. It's getting good press. It's getting good reviews and things. So it's it's rare, um, but sometimes. You know what's interesting too about the Spider Verse movies is that we hear a lot, and I don't even really know the answer to this. And I'm kind of like, it just I'm just observing and noticing. Mm. 
but we hear a lot of like with the culture war and stuff like that. Like, you know, when, when things like strange world, like say underperform, right. There's like this kind of narrative, like, Oh, well, you know, the, the Disney brand is, is not really, it, it's, it's damaged. And that's why people aren't going or this, that, and the other, but people also have to understand. And maybe that's true. I, I don't really know. And that's, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm admitting, I don't really know. But the thing that kind of makes me wonder though, is like when you see a movie like the Spider-Verse movies, which, mm. okay, that's Marvel, right? Now, uh, yes, we all know, we're nerds. We all know it's a Sony, right? We <laughs> right. all know the, the Sony deal and because we're like neck deep in this stuff. The soccer mom doesn't know that though. So yeah. when they go see Spider-Verse, they are going into that theater assuming it's a Disney movie. So it's like when those movies do well, it's like, well, okay, well, so the, the families are still going to what they believe are Disney movies still, you know what I'm saying? So it's interesting. It's an interesting dynamic here. Uh, um, uh, Josh, what, what are your thoughts on, um, on every, you know, uh, the box office, all that good stuff? And then yeah, before this- you answer that, Josh, and then after <laughs> that, if you could, uh, if you could follow up to the same question I had for Jay, was there ever an animated film that you had to see? In- okay, I'll answer. Not also, Josh. Wait a minute, Josh, Josh, Josh. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was already gonna be a long answer, guys. <laughs> uh, no, George, I'll answer your question first because I have been <laughs> in so many films opening weekend um, that are animated. Here's why. Um, first, I really appreciate the art uh i and well of of film in general um i had this pseudo argument not really just an explanation uh on x earlier today uh because uh mean girls paramount plus put mean girls on tiktok in like a 23 part thing and somebody asked i said i hate this and somebody said why and i said the moment that you take everything and put it on the same platform and just call it all content um people start to you're starting to train people to view everything no matter what it is whether it's a multi-million dollar movie that hundreds of people made or uh, a girl lip syncing to an olivia rodrigo song or somebody's political commentary it's all content it all is on equal levels uh and i just could not disagree with that more like uh you know me coming on talking about my politics is very different than people spending years making an animated film uh, or Mean Girls or whatever, right? Um, And and putting their artistic merit into it. Um, So I like to go see these films in theaters for a couple of reasons. One, the art of filmmaking, especially the art of animation, um, and just seeing it on the biggest screen possible is how it's supposed to... It's supposed to be seen that way. Um, Two, and actually George brought this up, so, like, Paper Man came out in 2012, which was the first use of the Meander programming where you got the 2D layered on top of the 3D look. Feast was the follow-up to that uh, a year or two later. But when Encanto came out in theaters, because I went to go see that movie in theaters, it was, uh, you know, came before it, a short came before it, which is Far From the Tree, which used that same Meander programming, but nobody talks about that short because nobody saw Encanto in theaters. And when you talk about streaming, a lot of the stuff that, especially shorts, just get buried in streaming. When's the last time you sat down and watched a bunch of shorts on Disney Plus? You know, like nobody really yeah. does. Um, and so the experience of seeing it in the theater allowed me to see that short and the continued expansion of the artistry and the technology combining together. Um, but then I also got to see Encanto, which was a fantastic film. Um, so I will see this film opening weekend because I want to see the short. I want to see the artistry in full, you know, vision. I don't want to watch a movie in 15 parts on my phone. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to see this movie. And I've seen countless animated films since theaters opened back up. So, I mean, that's nothing new for me. Um, so I'm very excited. So to answer your question, George, uh, uh, I'm very excited to see this film in theaters, and I've seen almost every Pixar or Disney film in theaters, at least in the past like ten years that I can remember. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean that's just my love of of animation in general. Um, but now that I've said that, I've totally forgotten <laughs> what the original question was <laughs> because we oh. were. Oh, the uh, what, what do you, oh, what the do you think? Of, yeah, the box office prospects. 
Uh, that is way up in the air. Going back to the uh, the conversation around content and everybody, everything being content, um, and Disney and also just Hollywood in general training people that you can wait two months, three months to see the film on on Disney Plus. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I don't think that Disney has really had a big runaway success since Frozen Two, since before the pandemic. This could be it, um, but I also fear that f we may never get to the Frozen levels ever again um, because just how people like to consume films these days. Um, mm. and, and that's the unfortunate part. Uh, I, I mean, if you go even this year, look at, uh, look at Elemental. You know, people, th and that went into the culture wars, right? People were just yeah. crapping all over Elemental because from the trailer, uh, not even from when the film came out, and it, it took a lot of word of mouth for people to finally see it in theaters five weeks later, six weeks later, whatever. And then by the time it hit Disney Plus, people were like, oh, I actually really love this movie. I don't know why <laughs> why people were making a big stink about it. It's like, well, you listen to the same three YouTubers that hate everything. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, you know that you can wait three months and, and see it at home for free. Which also yeah. goes to just some socio-economical talk that we probably will. That's too much to get into, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that's no, gonna it, be a huge deal for sure. I mean, the socio-economic thing is like it's hammering a lot of people, and we just had uh, the payments for student loan debt come back, right? So people are already their budgets are already being stretched and now they're gonna have to be paying more so i don't i think that that's an important part of the conversation is that an economic situation kind of thing yes it is but it is something that leading into this 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 fall and winter season i think we're gonna have an issue we're gonna have issues there people are gonna be you know I, i'm gonna have a hard time keeping my disney plus subscription as soon as loki's over because i know that they're not going to produce anything new for eight months probably if not a yeah. year before something new comes out so i think that that is part of the conversation is these studios yeah. are, that were already struggling are going to struggle some more. Yeah, and well, people and, are and, people are choosing. Oh, sorry, uh, no, you're good. People are choosing like what films they're going to see mm -hmm. far ahead of time because, mm -hmm. to be honest, this this year has been great for films as far as just really good films coming out, but nobody's seeing them. Um, you know, people went and saw the uh, Super Mario Brothers film, <laughs> but didn't see a bunch of stuff afterwards, and and I don't fault them because when you're dropping 50 to 100 bucks on a film, okay, for the next two months, we're probably not really going to see anything in the theaters. Um, you know, that along with the competition of literally everything else that you could watch on TV, on any streaming platform, TikTok, YouTube, whatever, like, um, and, you know, going into this holiday season, like, yes, this film is coming out, um, but so is the new Wonka film. Napoleon comes out the exact same weekend. Uh, you've got the new Aquaman movie that's going to end up coming out. So there are a bunch of films that are coming out, and people are going to have to pick and choose which ones they are going to lay down money for. And Wish may not be the one. Yeah, and, and people always say, like, oh, well, you know, I, I've heard the argument before, like, okay, well, Aquaman and Wish are two different demos. And that's true, but the issue is that mom and dad are going to go see aquaman though so right. it's like mom and dad are paying for their kid to go see wish so if they there's still that decision that's going to have to be made you know are we going to spend money on both of these are we just going to watch one of them so fascinating point uh josh and, fascinating point. and i feel like with wish especially in theaters i think mm -hmm. I, I mean aside from you know the like the little kid uh kind of establishment that goes on with a disney film especially with little girls like with the the young heroine as the main character you right. have that audience there but i feel like with this film especially since disney is promoting and marketing this film tied to the 100 years of the company and then mm. attaching it with a uh a, a short in the beginning of it once upon a studio that's literally going to showcase almost every single Disney character throughout the, the entire <laughs> length of the company in this heartfelt type of uh, uh, manner that I feel like a lot of Disney fans are now going to attach themselves 
to that. Maybe not necessarily to say, a oh, Wish may have a strong set of character arc or it may have a strong story, but I feel like since Disney is promoting and marketing this film because on the back of the 100 years of the company and then tying it with the Once Upon a Studio uh, animate, well, animated short, so to speak, but they're blending live action mixed with it, that uh, I feel like a lot of the older generation may go see that film because of what it ties back to. And, it, and, and for Once Upon a Studio, the fact that they have Olaf and Jeannie in the same room and talking to one another, and they actually got uh, recording footage of the late, great Robin Williams to actually reprise his role as the Jeannie, like, that alone would get me to go into that theater and, and see this movie because also it ties to with the, the short at the beginning. For those of you not aware of what George is is talking about, is it, is it, there was a trailer actually for the short, and it looks absolutely beautiful. It's stunning, and they use the classic kind of Mickey style. It's not that it's not the new um, the new style Mickey. It's like the old school Mickey. Tinkerbell's in this. All the characters, Moana, very very cool. It's very reminiscent of like Roger Rabbit with the live action mix with the animation, but it's a love letter. It's it's supposed to be like a love letter to Disney animation, and I think. From the trailer, I think it's really gonna. I think it's really gonna be a tearjerker. And, and oh, it is. And a lot of people said because they actually uh, showcased this at the Destination D twenty three down in Florida, and a lot of people said that they actually like were getting choked up by this thing. So, and the the whole aspect of this short is Mickey has to round up all his friends for a group photo outside of the, the main animation building. Well, we all know, if we all try to take a family photo, even just with, with ten people, it, it's, it's a job and a half. So, when you try to gather up <laughs> hundreds of animated characters, you know the shenanigans right. it's going to take to get this. But also having that heart tied into it well, of the history of the company. Yeah, it's beautiful, and I love and and Josh. I'm gonna get to you in a second because I I know you're huge on animation. I'm really curious your opinion on this trailer, um, but I love how it also it pays tribute to the animation, but it even pays tribute to like when you when you would watch Walt Disney on TV, and he would have Tinkerbell in his office, and he would dust a pixie dust off his suit and things like that. This was very reminiscent of 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 that. It felt like that, and it just it just. All around, just an absolute gorgeous tribute. But well, what are your thoughts, Josh? As a huge animation person, like, did you fall in love with this trailer? Are you excited to see it? Or, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see it. I think that this is a great piece of marketing to get people to this film. Again, like George said, it kind of reiterates this is the 100th anniversary celebration of the company. Um, I hope that they actually do a lot more of this in the sense of doing a trailer for the short that comes before the film for before the film too, or at least mentioning the short that comes before the film. Because I think um, for me, at least the selling point to go to the theaters sometimes is the short again, going back to 2012 when Wreck-It Ralph came out, I didn't know what the short was going to be before it. And then they showed paper man. Um, and I remember like seeing this interview years and years ago where somebody was talking about seeing like the skeleton dance in theaters before some, you know, random like Clark Gable movie. <laughs> and they were so like enthralled by it. Again, this is during a time where like you paid to get into the theater and then like you could leave whatever you wanted. Um, and so they sat around to like watch the short again before leaving after the short, like the second time around. That's how wow. much they love the short. And like, I had never understood that until I saw Paper Man. And I was like, this short's better than the film. Um, like, I like Wreck It Ralph, but Paper Man just blew me away so much. I wanted to like sit and, you know, sit and sneak in the back and like wait to like watch it again. Um, so obviously, this is not that type of short. This is much more of a celebratory um, tease, but it, it hits on nostalgia, which we know truly sells in this generation of film goers. Um, we love familiar characters, so that'll definitely make money. And I think this is a something that will truly help the film more than hurt it. So um, I'm excited to see it. Yeah, hundred percent. Jay, did you get a chance to check out, check out this trailer, or just while Josh was talking? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know this was coming out, so I had to go see it. Um, it is pretty extraordinary uh, for several reasons. One, 
it's very celebratory, but it's also it's also very endearing. Um, there, there's there's a little bit of nostalgia. There's a lot of nostalgia to it, of course. Uh, so yeah, I think it's going to do. I mean, just look at this. Like mixing two characters from completely different films that came out of the ocean. I mean, um, very clever, very entertaining. I saw that at the end of it, it was going to come out on ABC on October 15th. And that was a little bit of a bummer because you can go watch it before you actually go see it in the theater, which is a, kind of a disappointment. But that's a that's um, a good point. But yeah, I think I think this looks fantastic. Yeah. Oh, it looks beautiful. I mean, it looks absolutely beautiful. I mean, th this shot right here, you have okay. So you you have live action in the background. You have CGI and hand drawn all in one shot, and it's seamless. It's absolutely seamless. I, I'm just. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So we'll see how it does. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for that, for that, um, for that short. Now I want to ask you guys to coming back to wish. Do you guys think I'll, I'll start with, I'll start with you, Jay. Um, do you think, because you, we you touched upon earlier, like if, if, if the culture war kind of comes for this movie, it might not do as well. Do you kind of think that might be the case here? Like based on what we know of the movie, is it a possibility that could, that could be the case? Is it kind of depends on like what the, maybe the talent says in interviews or whatnot, or what, where, where do you kind of stand at the likelihood that this thing's going to kind of get in the middle of the, of the culture war, like something like, like, like little mermaid did or, or, or even elemental. Yeah, this is, this is a big, this is a big, I'm not sure because here's the problem. Here's the problem. And this is why <laughs> this is why uh, Bob Iger has said, I'm going to do my best to tamp down this these culture war issues is that once you start that flywheel, it's very difficult to get off of it. So the problem is, is that when you have when you're living in a time of like of excess and plenty, like we were living at the end of the late uh 20 teens right this is a time of end game this is a time of infinity war this is like that whole the the 2010s will go down probably as one of the most successful decades in american history likely right there's just it was just a good decade um it didn't really feel like we were in any i i can't remember any major wars like every all the things i have to say are positive right um we had come out of the financial crisis of of 20 2008 so that was good too that was a decade, and, and I pulled some some statistics that talked about like how Disney was performing, and I was I looked at it specifically comparing the ratio of what the average budget for their films were versus what the films brought in. Okay, it they were killing it that whole decade. They were they were killing it. This is the big Iger Iger super successful decade. He was doing park stuff. His films were doing amazing. He's buying. He's bought Star Wars. He's he's bought Marvel. He's he's killing it. And then, when you look at all of those things, you go, everybody's kind of on board with this. So even if I have issues with it, I'm just gonna kind of just go along. It's fine. Most of the, most things are positive. It's it's cool, right? The flywheel is di everything is positive for Disney. I'm loving what I see with Marvel. We got new Star Wars. The problem is. Winning, winning does cure a lot of evils, but mm. then when you start losing, a lot of little things start popping up, and that negative flywheel is really, really difficult to overcome because now people are looking for it. They weren't looking for it before. Now they're looking for it. So you, so it's one thing when you have somebody like come out like with the, with the Andor show, which I thought was phenomenal, but they somebody came out with the Andor show and was like, "This is a show against Trump," right? And you're like. Why did you even say that? Like, you're just going to ruin it for so many people that, like, now we have to talk about that instead of talking about your actual show. It's that's amazing. It's one of the it's the highest quality Star Wars product that has ever been put out into the marketplace. And now we're talking about Trump. I, this is not even. This shouldn't even be related. To get it out of here. The problem yeah. is that now, now everybody in the back of their mind is thinking, "Oh, remember when they said that thing about Trump?" And then because they came off a decade where they were so successful. They could even if they did weave in little things, people were kind of ignoring it. People stopped ignoring it, and the pandemic hit, and people said, "You know what? Everything's becoming political." The twenty 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 the twenty twenty election was awful. Like everything was politicized, and people went, "I'm going to put on my culture war goggles." And every time I see anything that could be against what I believe, screw those people, right? Like that's, 
<laughs> how it went. Yeah. Just, it takes a lot to overcome that flywheel because now, even if Disney minds its P's and Q's and dots its I's and crosses its T's, it doesn't mean people won't find a way to criticize it. Right. And I think I, I'm seeing that from both sides. It's like, you're not doing enough, you're doing too much. You're not doing enough, you're doing too much. I just think that as a culture, we need to get through this period of time, be done with it and move on. But I don't think it's going to be able to avoid the culture war conversation. It's going to come up in the culture war conversation at some way, shape, or point. It's going to come up. I do think that it can overcome it, but I don't think they can avoid it because everything is getting that that lens on it right now. Beautifully said. I agree with you 100% on that, Jay. What do you think, uh, Josh? Can uh, it yeah, avoid so, it? <clears throat> can they avoid it? It's a, I think it's more of a question of will they avoid it. Hmm. Okay. Um, here's what I mean by this. So they've done a good job. I think in the past few years of because uh, I want to go back to like, let's say like a decade ago it was the first time that they used their films or marketed their films as, hey, this film has the first gay character, the first gay kiss, the first well, right. That was a part of the marketing strategy. They've kind right. of backed off on that, which yeah. was probably the right move. Um, however, like Jay said, you started moving the train and it's real hard to stop that train. Um, but one of the things that I think Disney has done along with that, which they didn't intend for those two things to go together. Um, but with about like 2016, Zootopia very much being the first one, um, they've used a lot of real world things, uh, politics or uh cultures or social issues or whatever in their films um pulling from you know pixar's past and how great pixar had done you know like if you look at a film like wally which is about environmentalism um it did really well people still love that film regardless but uh you know then you go and you look at just looking at, at disney animation not anything else that they've done um but they did strange world which was again about environmentalism that did not do well because uh, it had a gay character um, or a, a non-binary, bisexual, non-binary, whatever it is. Um, but then they also had Encanto, which people complained about. Moana, people complained about. Ryan the Last Dragon, people complained about. Frozen 2, people complained about. All of those films carry with them some kind of cultural, um, from, either from being a, from a different culture or some kind of social message that goes along with them. They have not stopped that. And I don't think that this movie is going to stop that per se. Um, it looks, I mean, all of these characters definitely are not Eurocentric, right? right? And mm -hmm. so I think that you're automatically going to get people complaining about that, uh, especially when the big thing with animation and Disney in particular is that people see them as four children. And to, we kind of understand that anytime somebody says, think of the children, it's kind of a scapegoat answer. Um, and then secondly, anything that is for girls tends to be looked down upon and judged. Like when we talk about uh, like Into the Spider-Verse, right? All the dude bros come out and go like, Into the Spider-Verse is great. Love it. You know? And like, I love it too. Like, I'm not saying that it's bad. I just, you know, like all the dudes are like, finally an animated movie we're seeing. Um, but like, you know, when you talk about Encanto, uh, they're like, well, you know, they made like that one chick real buff and that's not cool or whatever, you know, it's like, uh, so you get all that kind of stuff. And so it's just going to happen because we've started the train on the tracks and they're going to be there. Maybe there's going to be fewer voices than there have been in the past. It seems like that's kind of in general, the, the negativity among social media seems to be hopefully dying crossing my fingers on that um you know like more intelligent conversations are happening more than just complaining and um outrage farming so right. we'll see i think that there's still going to be some some noise but hopefully less than it has been in the past yeah well said well said yeah i do notice that too i do feel like there is less outrage farming like you say uh josh out there right now it, it feels it's not gone completely um no. but it's definitely subsiding compared to like like two years ago, it was really bad. Really I mean, bad. really bad. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, George, what do you think? You think that, you think that uh, Witch can escape the culture war? Um, 
I mean, it, there is a possibility. I mean, so far, I haven't seen anything where Disney is kind of pushing to those boundaries like they were before. I mean, because we've talked about this many times uh, on the show, G, where like things are in the pipeline that are just coming right. out now that was in production two to three years prior. So it's like by right. the time it's released, you know, you're still dealing with some of those effects. Um, I, I feel like Disney would want to keep that out of uh out of that limelight in that aspect now is that what's going to happen it's hard to say because with with social media and people already in that mindset of what jay and josh were saying that it's like it, w once you start that that machine up it's so hard to to turn it off because people we're creatures of habit you know we adapt to what we see what we hear and with social media out there we can just like go on there with one with one click of a button, it's like all our thoughts and opinions are in the cyberspace and everybody in the world can see it. And then it's like it, it travels. And But my hope is that Wish does uh, come out on top. And I feel like Disney is promoting and marketing this film quite well, tying it to the 100 years and the, the Once Upon a Studio. So it, they're not like really – tying it into saying okay this this heroine is like you know this tough girl who's on her own yeah i think if they kind of like as jay said earlier let the film speak for itself let yeah. us as the audience interpret that we don't need it to be preached to us because each person that goes in and see these films we get a different aspect of what it means so yeah, yeah. i mean i i feel like that wish is starting to go into that direction and I think it is showing because of the numbers of how many times this trailer has been viewed. Yeah, it's interesting to see what Asha's personality is going to be like. I'm kind of getting like Rapunzel vibes from her, like in the trailer at least. You know, it could be totally different, but she kind of has that quirkiness that Rapunzel had with the I can't feel my face and all that stuff. Like that's a very punzy kind of thing. And I dig that. I love Tangled. It was one of my favorite Disney movies, you know. I'm kind of getting that energy. So to your point, George, like are they going to do like the whole – strong female thing which is like a lightning rod for the outrage farming and all that stuff and like people get all upset or whatever i, I don't know I, I, from the trailer it seems more tangled than anything else kind of like her her vibe but again i mean we have to wait and see you know so and, it'll be and, very interesting and, how that pans out and josh brought up a film that was quite interesting to this topic when he mentioned wally -E, right. where it, you know it talks about environmentalism and everything where but at the time when that movie was released, everyone was looking at the forefront of that film was, okay, these two robots uh, are falling in love. You see Wally, that's a very uh, kind of curious, optimistic type of character that he doesn't necessarily know what he's doing, but yet he is essentially the hero of this film. And then it ties into the back run of the story where it's like, okay, we need this plant in order to keep, you know, humankind going, you know, on this planet and have things growing where I feel that was the best approach where you can kind of give a message, but don't let it be the, the front part of the story where with Zootopia, it was kind of pushed at us in the, the front part of the story where it's like, okay, wow. It's like talking about like, in a sense through animal wise, you know, the different kind of culture war between the carnivores and, and non carnivores through like a political standpoint and, and, like who was running for mayor and what have you. So it was kind of like thrown in your face at it. Do I still enjoy Zootopia? Absolutely. I love the movie. Yeah. But but let me yeah, just yeah. say this. Would you not say that a movie like A Bug's Life is hitting the same points and hit and like yeah. not not doing it in this like it's doing it in the same sense, right? The story is about your place on the food chain and being able to it like the way that it's done in a bug's life and the way that it's done in Zootopia is not that much differently, but the world that we live in and how we as the audience and how we view how the we world interpret has approached. it. That, yeah, that right. makes sense. Right. Yeah, it's Great it's. Point. I would say it's coming less from like yes, they're making a deliberate point to tell that story, the way that they're doing it, but coming from an audience perspective, we approach films very differently now and. I think that that also comes from the way that we see the world politically, socially, et cetera. Social media has made us all close in this bubble about like our opinion of the world is the right opinion of the world. And that's, and I'm not saying, you know, 
anybody listening, anybody on this panel, whatever. I'm not saying that's you, but like I'm just saying that in general, that's kind of the way that a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking about, yeah. oh, I'll take in this fresh new idea and its opinion is worthwhile or this story is worthwhile. If it doesn't fit the narrative that you try and convince your life is leading, then it's woke garbage. Right. <laughs> exactly. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great point, Josh, what you brought up with Bugs Life. And that's an older movie, you know? And that movie is very much like the, um, you know, like we are the 99% kind of thing. Like there's a well, power. Yeah, but not, not that old, right? In our lifetimes. In our lifetimes, exactly, exactly. So it's that's fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. That was long. That was long before um, you know Bob Iger took over. I think it was what was that like 1998? I believe 1998. That movie came out. Yeah. So this has been going on for a little while now, you know. And even Michael Eisner, you know, in 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 the 90s, he was starting to dip into more cultural films, right? Like so, yeah. yeah we had the Beauty and the Beast, and we had the um, Little Mermaids, which were very traditional Disney European kind of stories. But then he started to dive into like Mulan. And he started diving into like Pocahontas and things like that, which, you know, was a departure. So it's been kind of this ongoing thing. Right. So you're absolutely right, Josh. It's not necessarily that Disney We don't, we don't talk about Mulan about. in that same way, right? Like a, a woman dressing as a man to go to battle. Like that's – nobody brings that up in the drag conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, could you? I, oh, I'm telling I mean, if that came – if they did an animated – if, if Mulan is an animated movie came out now – It'd be a huge culture war issue, right? A huge one, massive. I would. T I. I do. T I do have a slightly different view on this, though, because up, as <laughs> as a storyteller, <laughs> had to, and, I, and Josh and I have talked about this before too. So this is not this is not necessarily. If you listen to to me for a while, you know that I have this opinion. There's a difference between storytelling and propaganda. Let's just let me break down the difference between the two. Storytelling says I'm going to work out a shared experience and in my working out of that shared experience i'm going to collect all of the experiences that people could bring to the table and i'm going to showcase those through different characters and different character interactions and when you do storytelling accurately you start to bring in as many shared experiences as you can this is like what we call uh what is it for for um quadrant, for quadrant filmmaking we're bringing in as, mi as many experiences as we can so that this experience is sort of a ubiquitous experience. So what does it feel like to have your identity be called to something that is not traditional, right? Almost everybody has had that happen to them in some way, shape, or form. The problem is, is that propaganda is when you say one perspective is better than the other perspectives on the table. And I would argue that that's the main difference I see with the la the later we get with Disney films, the more they'll work in little things that are specifically the viewpoints of the people making the film that are not related to the actual story w in which the this, this story is taking place. So, so let me give you let me give you um, a couple of examples just to point this out. Like I would argue that um, now before before I make this argument, there's one giant caveat is that we're on the negative train so even if you tell a really great story that has no propaganda the negative train can still put one into your into your work they can speak for you and say clearly you were you did this film because you hate right. white males it's like, <laughs> no, right. like, that's not why we did this film but like now it's been put on me that's put in the marketplace now maybe maybe it's something it's the same thing as like when someone takes like luca for example luca's a fantastic film right uh, the, the gay population said, this is kind of our experience. Like this is, this feels right to us. This feels like it's our experience. Great. But that doesn't mean that Luca is not applicable to a bigger population. Right. right. So you can have both. And, and I think that film actually managed to escape the culture wars largely, even though it had that narrative about it, nobody yeah. really got all upset about it because it was like, yeah, yeah but that film didn't. There was no propaganda in that film. People just saw that from different perspectives and went, I've felt that way before. Oh, I could see how they would feel that way. And, right. and that is the, that's the difference. Like if we have stories, it's when we get the propaganda angle. And by the way, if propaganda is being spoken into the thing, I'm very, I, I, I am very moderate. So I can, for the most part, start to see both sides of the issue sometimes. Not always, because I'm biased too. Don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm usually biased towards the storytelling stuff, but not the political stuff. 
But think of the children, Jay. <laughs> <Think of children. laughs> but what one of the things I'm finding is that when I well, when I'll watch a film, I'll go, "Oh man, they just they just put that line in there. That was a cultural line. That was that was the the viewpoint of the per. That was propaganda. But if you're if you agree with the propaganda, you don't necessarily see it. Right, propaganda right. can escape your vision because you agree with the propaganda that's being put in there. So when the when the girl in Turning Red says, "My body, my choice," and it's a joke, you go, ha, 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 "That's a good joke." If you're on the other end of the aisle and you're a pro lifer, you go, "What the fuck?" Like you, now, <laughs> now my kids are gonna watch this movie and think that that's okay. You know, you know right. what I mean? Like I'm just giving you the different perspectives on it. That line exactly. is propaganda, even though it's a joke. It's the viewpoint of the person, not the story. The story is not the girl doesn't have to say that in the story for the story to make right. more sense. Right. So I, that's the only difference I think between like some of the newer films and some of the older films. Now you could look at the uh, the lens and say some of the older films have the propaganda of the of more traditional values, and that's offensive to other people, and that's true too. So it's like both. It's both sides. Yeah. Here's, here's, here's here's what I'll say about that. Uh, really quick, <laughs> I just want to interject with this. Um, so the you're talking about a Pixar film, mm-hmm. which the last I. I I've kind of talked about this recently. The last six Pixar films all feel the same in the sense that the people that made them very much told their stories. Um, Mm. Onward was directed by Dan Scanlon. He had his father die when he was really young. Mm. And the only thing that he knew of his father was like this audio recording of him, right? Which is the premise of the film. Um, Soul, same thing. Black director, Kemp Powers. Um, Luca, Italian director, Turning Red is a Korean-Canadian director, and even though I agree that that line, whether it was intended to be that way or not, can be interpreted as propaganda. However, the film in general, I felt like, and I know that Jay and I very much disagree on this because we've had this conversation before. (laughs) Uh, He thinks thinks it's one of the worst Pixar films. I think it's a a pretty good one as far as the last few years um, because it tells the story from a different angle. Does it tell it, it, it? Is it for everybody? I don't think so, but I think that it's an, at least an interesting film. Um, and then Elemental is about uh, uh, firstborn American, which Peter Son is, and so like all of these films have kind of come from the perspective of the director, uh, an art tour type of film, if you will. Um, that's not happening on the Disney side, though. But I think because people relate Disney and Pixar so much together mm-hmm. that from a perception, like like you were saying, OG, like anything that's animation, people go, well, that's just a Disney film. Uh, <laughs> and the problem is now, you know, people are just f- throwing flack at Disney for stuff they're not even making. Uh, you know, at least the Walt Disney animation team that has, they don't talk to the Pixar team at all. But, you know, I I understand, like, Pixar has also, or Disney has also made films like Zootopia, which is overtly, uh, you know, about fear mongering and uh, police brutality and racism and things like that. And like those conversations, are they for kids? I don't know. I've thoroughly enjoyed the film though. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's a difference. I think there's a difference too between like we should have different voices making films, right? right. Like yeah. for sure. Um, there's a, there's a, I think that there's no reason why different voices making films can't make those films applicable to a larger audience, right? Um, there's no reason for that. I think the difference in my mind, because this is what Josh and I totally agree on, we should have more voices making films. We should have their perspectives included in the films. What I'm talking about too, though, is those films don't need to go outside of their realm of... Uh, influence to include other messages that are literally just put in there without it being a part of the story. Once the, if things are part of the story and thing X has to happen because if thing X doesn't happen, if the, the whole story about Luca, right, is he has to, he has to pretend he's somebody that he's not while, while engaging with the world in a particular way. Right. Okay. Um, the way that he goes about doing that, those points all fall into place they're all part of that story there's nothing that feels like it's coming out of left field to be like so when th- something comes out of left field that's when it starts to get into the propaganda because you're like why was that included it didn't matter to the story 
the story that did not matter to the story. So why did it occur in the story? Well, then the the only lens that you can put on that is they must have wanted to say that, even though it's not part of this story. And so I think that that's that's where the line is. It's like every story is about something that a human being has experienced. You can't find a story that isn't. You could make you could make anthropomorph anthropomorphic dishware to tell the yeah. story of Beauty and the Beast. But a human has experienced some of those things. I right, don't feel right. as valuable anymore. I've been tucked away in a cupboard and no one likes me anymore. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to bring the, the world in to have a relationship with me. These are very human things that we really all care about. It's when you right. put those things that aren't part of the story in that you go, where did this come from? So I think Josh and I are in agreement on that. It's just a matter that comes of... From, that comes from bad writing and, and yes. bad oversight. And I think that uh, as, as far as turning red is concerned, like that also comes, you know, like George was saying, these films are in development for several years. You also look back a few years. That's when we had a big issue with, uh, you know, John Lasseter and like yeah. him leaving and Correct. having Pete Doctor come in 100%. and like a kind of a lack of authority at the top. Yeah. And somebody who's a brand new director to, you know, full length feature films being kind of given the green light in a time where there's not a lot of oversight there's bound to have like those kinds of things. And it's, to me, it's, it's one or two lines in a film. Yes. Propaganda E, but overall, I think that the message of those films still is great. But I, I think that that goes back to the outrage farming of, we pick these one little notes from a film and go like, nah, that's why the film is awful. And we can't show our children that because of this one single thing. Mm. Um, and and just, I be, just, just to be clear, that's not why I think that film's awful. <laughs> no, I know. You just don't, you're yeah. just not into the boy band thing. I get it. Um, <laughs> but that's fine. But we didn't do that years ago. And I think that that just becomes, yeah. you know, yes. like we're that's true. much more atone, attuned to that kind of thing. And, right. and I think it's unfair to the storytellers that, you know, you like if you look at television, you make one bad episode of a show and people kind of go like, uh, that was, you know, not a great episode, but I'll still tune in next week. But you do that with a film, you have like one bad scene and people go, worst film I've ever seen this year. Well, and I have yeah. to actually kind of bring up this too. Now, this has really like, has something to do with Disney, but absolutely nothing to do with Disney. <laughs> it's almost like uh, the episode of South Park. It was uh, Mr. Hanky, the Christmas Pooh, where it was like the town was so captivated of getting rid of anything offensive to them that had to deal with Christmas. So they started nitpicking and kind of dissecting everything. Oh, no, I'm offended by this. I'm offended by that. Till when they ended up doing their, their Christmas, Christmas uh, pageant play, it had absolutely nothing to do with anything. It didn't make no sense. It was just a big blob of shit, no pun intended. Right. But it was it's just, the same with, the, with uh, the show Community and how they were trying to come up with a mascot and eventually – it's like a weird, gray, ugly being that they called the human being because that was, you know, the just like the general feeling of a mascot, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it, kill, it kills it because it's like there's nothing fun about it anymore when you take everything that could be offensive yeah. out of something. And I bring up South Park because, again, just like how OG said, like any kind of animation you can watch, you just automatically think it's Disney. Like I watch South Park. It's like, oh, it screams Disney. You know, it's like so. <laughs> but especially <laughs> well, since they actually had Randy from South Park actually make a little cameo in uh, uh, the Chippendale Rescue Rangers. I thought that was yeah. very yeah. interesting. <laughs> but And that was a great movie. Josh, did you see that one, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, the new one? I did, yeah. I love that movie. Um, and... Uh, I I mean a lot of people hate it and I don't understand why but I was how do you hate I was, it it's yeah. amazing yeah it's great it's amazing I thought I thought they handled and, and this is coming from someone I'm not really into I even talked about it with the wish stuff like I was like oh man I hope they don't go too meta right I don't typically like meta mm. Roger Rabbit is a gorgeous masterpiece I love that movie but I was kind of worried with Rescue Rangers going into that one like oh man they're gonna really lean into this meta stuff Worst. can they do it as good as Steven Spielberg did it with Roger Rabbit probably not we'll see i watched i watched rescue rangers i was so impressed i was laughing so hard and i thought it was really really clever too how they kind of explain things like how the voices were like they, like because they don't talk like that in this movie right? right and they explain it like that was like for the acting job right. or this role yeah. I, that was so clever how they switched that up I, I thought it was such a brilliant movie i actually loved it i gotta rewatch it <laughs> i absolutely loved it 
but I want to thank you, you guys, for coming on today, talking shop with uh, talking shop with us today about um, Wish, Disney Animation, even the cultural, all the stuff. Really, really good time, Josh. If you can remind everybody at home where they can find you on social media, sir. Uh, you can find me on all the regular kind of socials, uh, Modern Mouse Josh, or on YouTube. Uh, you can go to youtubecom slash Mouse, where I talk about animation all the time. Yes, he does, and and Muppets too, and, and Muppets, Muppets too. too. <laughs> so go ahead and uh, subscribe to him. I'll be linking his uh, his stuff down below. So definitely check out Mr. Modern Mouse. And down below, we got host of the Story Geeks, Mr. Jay Shear. Jay, if you let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media, sir. Go over to Josh's Patreon and sign up for his Patreon because he and I are going to be arguing for the next hour about turning red. Nerd Wars, round one. Yeah, yeah. Josh is literally one of my favorite people on earth. So even when we don't agree, it's still a good time, in my opinion. Um, See, now why'd so, you have to go and ruin it by saying that? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's so rivalry ends when somebody gets shot and dies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think uh, it's, it's so funny to me because we live in a world that wants to be so like. We live in a world that wants to build its teams so much. Yeah. Right? Like you have to be on this team or you have to be on that team and you have to be. And like. I just think that that's so ludicrous that I'm I'm just really happy that that I get a chance to have friends like you guys where we can disagree but still still at the end of the day be like hey look we're still we're still friends we're still good to go absolutely um, because it's just too there's too many people fighting out there and it's that's not it's just not right uh, anyways you can find me on X probably saying some nonsense like I was saying on this show <laughs> uh, at Jay Shear you can find me over there you can also find me um, how stories work with Jay Shear. Um, I am uh, working on a short film, and we just released the full the the table read of the short film um, that I'm working on. And I was just talking to my DP before we jumped on here, and it's, we're lining up some pretty cool stuff. In fact, I'm really hoping that the lead actress that we have will come through because I will announce it on here. It's a pretty big deal, so uh, at least awesome. this is me. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, how stories work with Jay Shear or X at Jay Shear. Perfect, perfect. And down below, last but not least, we got Citrus George, host of our Walt Disney World show here, Citrus Corner. George, you can let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media, sir. Absolutely. You can find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Disney George. You could also check out the podcast I'm part of called A Walk with Walt. And, of course, you'll find me here on my home base at Orange Grove 55 with Citrus Corner with all that sweet, juicy, but sometimes sticky Disney news and info. And uh, it was a really great show. And uh, definitely uh, coming up, as Jay had mentioned earlier on in the show, uh, after our Ahsoka review of the finale, we got another great Story Geek show coming up, which actually, here's a little teaser. We kind of dipped into it a little bit on, on this show, and we're going to go into it more further. But that's all I'm about to say for that. But hopefully... Uh, uh, Josh can uh, join us. I'd love to get his yes, uh, take we on need it Josh. as well. Because we uh, basically, more so, I just want to see Jay and Josh go at it. So it's, it's <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, th so thank you everybody for joining today, and thank you all for watching. Comment down below with all your thoughts on everything we discussed today, and as always, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye, bye, everybody. <laughs>